We set out from the trail of the Coeur d'Alene's Park in Plummer, Idaho. We took a short half hour ride downhill to Chat Collette Lake and Campground. There were five of us on this trip. Left to right is me, Jared, Rowdy, Darian, and Ken. Chat Collette Lake is the south tip of Lake Coeur d'Alene in northern Idaho. It is beautiful, idyllic country covered with forested mountains and scenery. We enjoyed our freeze-dried dinners courtesy of Jet Boil, played a little cards, and got some sleep. Some of us slept in tents, some in bivy bags, some under the stars, fortunately, the bugs weren't too bad. We were up and riding on the trail early the next day. From Chat Collette Campground, we headed down a dirt side road to the Trail of the Coeur d'Alene's. We crossed the lake on the old railroad bridge. Most of this 73 mile long trail is an old reclaimed railroad line from Plummer to the town of Mullen. The Chat Collette Bridge is a major feature of the Trail of the Quarter Lanes. It's over 3,100 feet long and was built over a hundred years ago in 1921. After the bridge, we followed the trail along the western shore of Lake Coeur d'Alene. The scenery along this path is just breathtaking.
Along the lake is the town of Harrison. We head east from there and ride along the Coeur d'Alene River. There were some dirt patches with construction along the mostly paved path. Little did we know about the rough road which was ahead later in the day. How are we doing on pace, guys? How's the pace? What? Great. Pace is good? 15 miles an hour, 16 Yeah, we're about 16, 15, 16. We'll try to keep it there. No, we don't. Don't want to get everybody burned out and then have the last 20 miles be a pain. The last 20, last 20 miles is all downhill. That's true. Along the path are several wetland areas. We were pretty excited to see this mother moose and her calf feeding among the grasses. This seems like prime moose territory with the wetlands and grasses. We saw another pair of moose feeding along our way. We took a brief pit stop at the Black Rock Trailhead before heading east on the trail of the Coeur d'Alene's. We only saw a few other camping cyclists along our trip. These ones had a bit slower pace. The trail of the Coeur d'Alene not only serves a recreational purpose, but it's also a solution to environmental problems left behind by Idaho's mining industry. Silver, lead, and zinc were discovered in the valley around 1884, and a rail line was built to access the mines around 1888. Much of the rock in the rail bed was either waste rock from mines or tailings containing heavy metals. The rail bed was also contaminated with spills from passing trains. To correct these environmental problems, the Union Pacific Railroad, U.S. government, the state of Idaho, and Coeur d'Alene tribe partnered to build this trail. The thick asphalt and the gravel barriers on the sides of the trail serve as a permanent cap to isolate contaminants from the surrounding environment. The rail line was abandoned in 1991. The trail of the Coeur d'Alene's opened in 2004. There are some remnants of the heydays of the mining industry, like this old rusty equipment along the trail. Clear. 
There are several small, historic old mining towns along the trail of the Coeur d'Alene's. Towns like Silverton, Osborne, and Smelterville. We're in Kellogg now, and we're next to the ski resort, and a uh, nice little park here, a little bit of shade, just <laughs> resting our bums and getting our water refilled, a little bit of a snack. Nice restrooms, running water, a good place for a stop. We stopped in Wallace for lunch at the Red Light Garage, famous for its ice cream and real live UFO. As we near the end of the trail of the Coeur d'Alene's near Mullen, Idaho, we pass the Lucky Friday Mine. It's one of few remaining mines operating in the Silver Valley. It reaches 10,000 feet below the surface, and they mine silver, lead, and zinc. They've been doing it here since 1942. It's expected to operate another 20 to 30 years. As we leave the trail of the Coeur d'Alene's, we cross over I-90 southbound to start climbing a dirt road to the Stevens Lake Trailhead. From there, we continue uphill to Lookout Pass. We rode the Northern Pacific Trail to the Lookout Pass area, which is home to a ski area 
and right now there are hundreds of bikes there waiting for riders of the Hiawatha Trail. This is the highest point of our trip at about 4,700 feet. From a lookout pass, we descended on a rough, rocky old road. This was the smooth section. We got down to I-90 around the Taft exit and then started climbing again to the Hiawatha Trail. We were hoping to go down the trail to a campground, but they were closing up when we arrived. We ended up at the far end of the Hiawatha parking lot, camped out on the route of the Olympian Trail. It was nice and quiet. We set up camp, had dinner, rinsed off in the creek and filtered some water, then went to bed. It was so dark, the stars were spectacular. We got up early the next morning, a little chill in the air. We were up before anyone was around at the Hiawatha Trailhead, so we headed right into the St. Paul Pass <laughs> Tunnel, also known as the Taft Tunnel. This tunnel is the first big feature on the route of the Hiawatha. The tunnel is over a mile and a half long. It is pitch dark when you get inside, so good lights are a must. You have to be careful while walking or bicycling through the tunnels because there are gutters along the walls. As it is deep in the mountain, there's a lot of mud and moisture on the ground. I took it slow to avoid too much splash up, but some of the others had different ideas.
inside the Taft Tunnel, the gentle downhill grade travels through beautiful evergreen forests covering the Bitterroot Mountains. As you look across the valley, you can see trestles that we'll be crossing in just a few miles. There are seven trestles and ten tunnels on the way down the trail. The Taft Tunnel is the longest at 8,771 feet. The Kelly Creek Trestle is the longest and tallest at 850 feet long and 230 feet high. The route of the Hiawatha is about 15 miles long. The Milwaukee Road Railroad built this passage to the west coast through the Bitterroot Mountains between 1906 and 1911. The cross-country railroad was originally supposed to cost $45 million, but ballooned to over $200 million. Intercontinental freight and passenger service started on these rails around July 4th of 1909. The railroad survived a devastating wildfire in 1910 that burned between two and three million acres in Idaho and Montana. This railroad operated until about 1980. Part of the route of the Hiawatha Trail opened in 1998 and the Taft Tunnel opened in 2001.
We made it to the end of the trail and got on a smooth dirt road. It runs along a fork of the beautiful St. Joe River. The road turns to asphalt and we made a stop in Avery for breakfast and a nice break at the old train station. We toured a historic rail car from the old days. Avery also features an historic museum, a pizza shop and a small country store. You can tell this was 1950s, 60s. Man, this is, seems huge. Here's the kitchen right yeah. there. Little kitchen. They were big, big cars. Wow. And more, more stuff here. From Avery, we headed west on the St. Joe River Road. Beautiful river views along the way with plenty of fishermen. Quick break. We eventually made it to the town of St. Mary's, Idaho. We stopped at the subway for sandwiches and a little rest before the final leg of our trip. Hi. Hello. How are you? Good. Enjoying your bike ride? So far. From St. Mary's, we headed west with a pretty good climb up Highway 5. This road has been plagued with weather problems like mudslides, but recent road work made this a pretty good section. We climbed to the top of the pass with the wide open spaces below. From there, it was downhill back to Chapcolette Lake. There was a slight grade to climb back to the trail of the Coeur d'Alene's Park and the end of our journey in Plummer, Idaho. The total ride distance was about 189 miles, about 5,500 feet elevation gain, and about 14 hours of saddle time. An awesome adventure. <laughs>